Welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Silvia Lindinger-Sternath and I'm an associate professor in counseling at the University of Providence. I came from Penn State University in 2015 where I met one of my co-authors. I got my PhD and a master's in counseling in Ohio and another master's in clinical psychology and a psychotherapy certificate from my native country, Austria. I love to work with diverse populations across the world to actually on trauma and to increase their resilience and their wellness. Uh, EMDR has enriched my clinical practice and I have also published and presented on mindfulness, resilience, uh, addiction, suicide prevention, and online counseling at the national and international level. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sylvia. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Varinder Kaur. I'm an affiliate professor of counseling at Northwestern University, Illinois. I'm also a licensed professional counselor in the state of Michigan. Currently, I'm also serving as a president-elect for the Michigan Association of Counselor Education and Supervision. Previously, I have worked in different clinical settings as a clinical mental health counselor such as I worked in university counseling center, private practice setting, inpatient and outpatient clinical settings and primary care facility, where I worked with different client populations and helped them in improving their mental health conditions. My research interests include holistic wellness related approaches, mindfulness related approaches, addiction related issues, multicultural issues in counseling and advocacy for counseling profession. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fernander. My, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Yek Tividianingsi, an associate professor of statistic program, Department of Mathematics, Universitas Indonesia. I got my PhD on statistics in Bogor Agricultural University in Indonesia. My research interest is on applied statistics that analyze any data using statistical methods for any field. I met Dr. Sylvia for the first time when I was a visiting researcher in Pennsylvania State University in 2014. We discussed about data analysis in psychology or psychometric. And now we are doing research together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yekti. Hello, one and all present here. I'm Ashok Kumar Patel. I'm a doctoral candidate at Dean Dayal Upadhyay University, Gorakhpur, India. I have done Master of Philosophy in Clinical Psychology from Postgraduate Institute of Behavioral Sciences and <clears throat> Behavioral and Medical Sciences, Raipur, Chhattisgarh. And I'm also a registered clinical psychologist registered with Rehabilitation Council of India. Currently, I'm serving as an All India Council member for Indian Association of Clinical Psychologists and as a member of Juvenile Justice Board, Balrampur, Uttar Pradesh. My professional interest includes anxiety, depression, OCD, schizophrenia, attention, memory, psychosexual problems in child and adolescents. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Um, I start now sharing our presentation. Uh, to share how we actually uh, conducted our study. So I want to talk a little bit about the background of our study. Uh, this coronavirus is really an exceptional global health challenge with globally confirmed cases more than 130 million and almost 3 million people already died. So this worldwide coronavirus pandemic has really uh, caused potential trauma and related mental health problems and there are already studies out there that have shown 
depressive symptoms, anxiety and sleep problems, but also uh, mental health problems, including uh, anxiety in China, also increased anxiety, panic disorders, and obsessive compulsive disorder in Germany, where actually more than 50% reported at least one mental health issue related to this pandemic. There are potential responses to such a pandemic, and it's a range from denial to being frightened of becoming infected with the virus. There are other studies reported cognitive change, avoidance, loss of social functioning, patterns of compulsive thinking, acute stress, panic disorders, and also re related to anxiety, like I already mentioned. So when we actually collected the data for our study, it was in July 2020, the full impact of this pandemic was unknown. So there were a combination of stresses for people, like some lost their jobs, some uh, couldn't uh, meet with their families and friends anymore. They may not have had the technology needed. So it was really uh, a challenge to adapt to a new reality for most of the people across the world. There was a lot of fear to be infected because there was no vaccine at this time and people perceived lack of control. So when we look at all these factors that really led to COVID-19 phobia and a horse at all uh, who developed also a measurement which we are using in our study defined COVID-19 phobia as an extreme response of fear of contracting the COVID-19 virus. COVID-19 phobia can manifest in different areas at the psychological, psychosomatic, economic and social level. Then that second factor we were interested in was, is, was resilience. And resilience is a protective factor. And resilience is the ability to maintain actually healthy functioning despite adverse events or crises, bouncing back to normal functioning after these difficulties. High levels of resilience are characterized of being optimistic, being uh, more positive, acting positively, and representing self-assurance when experiencing difficult life situations. People with high resilience usually are characterized um, as positive, and even when they experience a crisis, their mental health outcome is positive because they are described as being more flexible and more adaptive to such uh, challenges. So resilience and COVID-19 phobia were the two major variables we were interested in in our study. We wanted to find out how are people dealing with continuing stresses to sustain mental health and how resilience has influenced the response to COVID-19 phobia in various nations. The World Health Organization also provided actually guidelines for resilience because of the importance to respond to such a pandemic. Resilience towards uh, the levels, psycholo psychological, psychosomatic, economic, and social factors of COVID-19 phobia are important. And uh, increasing resilience levels by providing the most effective professional counseling services for clients of diverse backgrounds was another um, motivator for our study. So the rationale for this study was basically considering the prevalence of mental health issues, like I already mentioned the studies, um, we also wanted to focus on a protective measure and uh, studies have shown increase in mental health issues, including insomnia, PTSD, and phobia during this pandemic. And there were actually lack of studies uh, on resilience toward COVID-19 phobia in different nations. So while other researchers uh, across the world were focusing on finding strategies to end the spread of the virus, uh, we 
must understand resilience for clinically effective therapeutic applications in diverse populations. And so our focus was on uh, finding out if resilience basically has an impact on COVID-19 phobia to find effective treatments that can benefit of detailed information on how, how resilience impacts the level of COVID-19 phobia in individuals from different nations. So the objectives uh, of our study, we are exploring whether resilience affects the level of COVID-19 phobia, determining the level of resilience to a psychological, psychosomatic, economic, and social factors of COVID-19 phobia in various nations. We really were interested if there was a difference investigating whether there is a correlation between demographic data and resilience related to COVID-19 phobia. Thank you, Dr. Sylvia. Here, uh, I will be talking about uh, how we proceed our study and uh, my focus uh, will be on uh, some points like uh, uh, how did we get the ethical consideration, the recruitment of the participants, creation of our electronic forms, selection of our uh, uh, Facebook Messenger friends, forwarding the survey to the friends, and uh, finally, we end up with the follow-up. Well, very first, this study was presented towards the Institutional Review Board of University of Providence for the approval. After getting the approval, we followed the research protocol uh, of uh, American Counseling Association 2014, especially. Well, after getting the con ethical consideration, we moved towards the uh, creation of uh, electronic Google uh, survey. And uh, we is created the electronic survey and shared with our Facebook Messenger app friends. And uh, with this uh, uh, link, we have shared a little bit about the study with them uh, along with the consent form. <clears throat> Second step, we took, uh, uh, we just uh, uh, selected five to 10 of our friends and requested them to forward this survey to five to 10 of their friends who are not the direct friend of the authors. And uh, <clears throat> in the next step, we just followed with them and we asked them to calculate how many people have received our survey. Uh, this was necessary uh, because we were interested to document how many people have received and we were interested to calculate uh, the response rate actually. And we were trying to ensure that we are collecting data from a broader range of a different uh, broader range of population of different nations. So uh, we have shown our uh, diagram over here. You can understand very well how we proceed our data collections. By using this electronic survey method, we invited 1,267 of our friends who has given the consent to participate in our study and who were fluent in English. Out of 1,267 individuals, 902 participants decided to participate in our study and they responded to our online survey, which results a total of 71% of our total reached to the population. 
those who didn't agreed with our consent form were not eligible to part participate in our survey and their response was removed from our study which leads to 887 participants missing data incomplete answer was also eliminated from our study and uh, we next slide please well by this we uh, made a cluster you can see the countries who were participated in our study and uh, we decided to combine european countries because english is not the primary language for most of the european countries and thus the number of participants of each country were lower than the country in the survey was being conducted finally we uh, comprise 812 participants in our study so our to uh, come our final uh, data for the analysis was of 812 participants thank you all right now i'm going to discuss instruments that we use to collect data for our study we use three instruments demographic questionnaire covid-19 phobia scale and brief resilience scale The first instrument we used was demographic questionnaire in which we asked our participants to share their information on their age, gender identity, marital status, country of birth, country of residence, ethnicity, race, level of education and professional status. The important thing is that we uh, did not ask them any identifiable information, uh, for example, uh, their social security number, their email IDs, or their driver license IDs, and it was completely anonymous. And the second instrument that we used was COVID-19 phobia scale. It is a 20 item self-report questionnaire and a five point like a type scale ranging from one to five, where one is strongly disagree and five is strongly agree. It has four factors, psychological, psychosomatic, economic, and social. Uh, we identified good internal consistency, which was evidenced by Cronbach's alpha coefficient value 0.93 of 20 items for the overall scale, which means all the items on the scale measured the same construct throughout, which was COVID-19 phobia in our case. We also found good internal consistency for all four subscales, which was evidenced by their Cronbach's alpha coefficient values. And we found good item validity uh, with the help of Spearman's rank method, uh, which indicates that all the items on the scale measured the construct that it was supposed to measure, which was COVID-19 phobia. The third instrument that we used was Brief Resilience Scale. It is a six-itemed self-report questionnaire, uh, which is a five-point like a type scale ranging from one to five. One means strongly disagree and five means strongly agree. Uh, we calculated internal consistency, um, which is evidenced by Cronbach's alpha coefficient value of 0.65. Now, in general, the Cronbach's alpha coefficient value equal to 0 0.70 or higher is considered as satisfactory or acceptable. Uh, but in this case, the value close to 0 0.60 can be considered as acceptable or satisfactory because the scale has only six items and that might have reduced its internal consistency. However, we found good item validity uh, with the help of Spearman's rank method, which shows that uh, all the items on the scale measured the construct resilience and nothing else. Thank you. Now we continue for statistical analysis. Uh, we have three research questions in this research that uh, the first is, does resilience affect the level of COVID-19 phobia? And the second, are there differences in resilience level toward COVID-19 phobia among different nations? And the third, do we 
do demographic data correlate with re resilience? And we have uh, we use and clean data set, and then we have 812 respondents. This graph uh, show the number of respondents based on nations and gender. And we see from this uh, bar chart that the highest number of respondents is India and the lowest is from Pakistan, which is the, the orange color show the female respondent and the blue one is male. And this uh, bar chart show the number of respondents based on professional status. And our respondents, uh, we have highest number uh, for employ full time. And this graph so shows the number of respondents based on marital status. And the highest number of respondents is never married and married, and the lowest is separated. And this one uh, show the number of respondents based on age group which is the highest number of respondents is in the second group that is uh, 25 to 35 years old. Uh, and then we, we are now in hypothesis one as the research question one and Resilience statistically significantly affects the level of COVID-19 phobia. This result is supported. We use simple linear regression for this uh, analysis. And the result and four simple linear regression models were used to determine the effect of resilience on the four COVID-19 phobia scales, they are psychological, psychosomatic, economic, and social factors. Based on this computation or the result, the results say that resilience, statist resilience statistically significant affect the psychological, psychosomatic, economic, and social factors. In the second hypothesis, uh, resilience statistically significantly differs for each of the five nations. Uh, in this part, we use kruskal wallis test method. The objective of the test is, are the medians of resilience scores the same for every nation? And we show uh, based on this result, there are different resilience levels toward different nations. And the box plot here in the right side show that the median of the resilience scores are different. The lowest is from Indonesia and the highest is from USA. And the third hypothesis, there is a statistically significant positive correlation between age and the level of resilience. This result also supported. The, the method we use is Kruskal-Wallis test also. And the object, of, the object of this test are the medians of resilience scores the same for every group of demographic variable. And based on this table, uh, we have the result that the data analy analysis with the Kruskal-Wallis test did not find a difference in resilience scores. 
between females and males. However, there was a statistically significant difference in resilience scores based on participants' marital status, educational level, and professional status. And we have this, uh, all our box plot. We, we can uh, see that box plot of marital status, educational level, and professional status have different in median. So uh, the, this, this, this graph support the result of the computation that uh, resilience score are different in these three, uh, these three uh, categorical variable. But for box plot of gender, the median for uh, female and male almost uh, almost the same. Uh, we have limitations of the study. Uh, the first is sampling is non-probabilistic sampling. So the conclusions do not apply in general. In the second, distribution of respondent is not equal. From European countries, we have 88 respondents, India, 396 respondents, Indonesia, 184 respondents, Pakistan, 38 respondents, and USA, 106 respondents. That we can see in this bar chart that the highest is from India and the lowest from Pakistan. And the third limitation is including, in, including only English speaking individuals from different nations, which eliminated non-English speaking people. Thank you. All right, now I'm going to share discussion and conclusion of our study results. Our first research question states, does resilience affect the level of COVID-19 phobia? And the answer is yes. We found that resilience statistically significantly affects all four COVID-19 phobia factors with a negative correlation, which means the higher the resilience level, the lower the level of all four COVID-19 phobia factors, including psychological, psychosomatic, economic, and social. For example, if a person has a higher resilience level, that person will have a lower tendency to develop psychological issues such as depression, anxiety, stress, etc. This result is supported by previous research. Um, one of the previous research supports uh, that resilience can be a protective factor against mental health problems, especially related to adverse life conditions. It is partially supported by another conceptual study, um, which indicates that the resilience factor of flexibility might be the most important factor in responding to the situational demands of COVID-19. Our second research question states, are there differences in resilience levels towards COVID-19 phobia among different nations? And the answer is yes. We found that the highest level of resilience was in the United States of America, followed by Europe, Pakistan, India, and Indonesia. This result was also supported by a previous research um, in which Galloway explored the economic resilience of different nations by comparing their resilience index data, including resilience factors such as economic risk quality and the supply chain. However, uh, we could not find any other similar study till date that measured psychological resilience levels toward COVID-19 phobia among different nations. Our third research question states, does demographic data correlate to resilience? And again, the answer is yes. Uh, we found that the higher the age of participants, the higher the level of resilience, which means older people in our sample showed a highest level of um, resilience, higher level of resilience as compared to younger people in our sample. However, we could not find any difference in resilience score between females and males, which means both females and males almost showed 
same level of resilience toward COVID-19 phobia. Uh, and then we found a statistically significant difference in resilience scores based on participants' marital status, education level, and professional status. Under marital status, we found that people who identified themselves as divorced showed highest level of resilience, followed by people who were married, people who were never married, widowed, and then separated. Under education level, uh, we found that people with doctoral degree showed highest resilience level toward COVID-19 phobia, which was followed by people with master's degree, people with bachelor degree, people with some professional degree, uh, people with some college but no degree, and then finally high school degree or equivalent. Uh, finally, under professional status, uh, we noticed that people who identified themselves as retired showed highest resilience level toward COVID-19 phobia, followed by people who were part-time employed, people who were full-time employed, people who were not employed looking for a job, people who were not employed and not looking for a job, and then finally students. So based on our experiences while conducting this research, we offer uh, suggestions to future researchers. First, we encountered an issue uh, related to unequal number of responses from different nations, because we recruited our participants on Facebook Messenger randomly. Um, and therefore, we suggest future researchers to recruit research participants by some other means. For example, by inviting organizations or communities so that the number of responses from different nations do not differ greatly from each other. Secondly, uh, we suggest future researchers to replicate the study with participants from non-English speaking nations so that uh, we can see if the results are consistent with the present study or not. We also suggest exploring more details on the resilience factors in participants from various nations um, to promote uh, various counseling you know, strategies, um, client-based counseling strategies that can promote client wellness. Thank you. I would like to offer some implications for mental health professionals. Uh, the first area is fostering resilience in clients. Since it's ha it has shown such a large impact on dealing with COVID-19 phobia. So exploring specific factors to improve resilience in diverse clients across the globe. Also focusing on strengths self-assurance, life purpose, spirituality, and gratitude to increase in resilience. Also explaining that with the crisis comes always an opportunity that impacts resilience positively. When people overcome a crisis, usually they come out stronger afterwards. Considering a holistic approach to strengthen resilience, to really encourage clients to take care of their bodies uh, their nutrition, doing some exercise, the care of their minds by staying positive, maybe practicing some mindfulness and also praying or doing meditation for the spiritual area. And first uh, of all, also staying connected with their friends and family members with technology. The second area is practicing self-care as a health professional yourself. So collaborating between uh, different healthcare providers and mental health professionals is beneficial. Mental health providers should also practice uh, regular self-care to actually increase their own resilience because if you are not taking care of yourself, you can't help anyone else. Mental health counselors need to be flexible uh, with offering online counseling, counseling services. And if they are not um, having prior experience, they should seek training. Consulting with supervisors, mentors, and colleagues uh, regarding resilience can be really beneficial and useful. 
and professional counselors may offer 24 hours hotline service uh, services due to COVID-19 during this uh, challenging time. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send an email. Um, thank you for your attention.